today we're going to be talking about an introduction to feline behavior and basic needs. Um, so obviously here at Creature Teachers, we are very much about letting our pets be who they truly are as much as is possible. So really, we're just going to be learning how to love cats for the weirdos that they are. If my thing will decide to go. Okay. Uh, so we're going to break it down into two parts. We're going to talk about basic needs. So part of this is finances, making sure that you are financially prepared for a cat, as well as veterinary care. So what their basic medical care needs are. Husbandry is a huge one for cats. Safety for them. And then some basic grooming information. And then we're also going to talk about normal feline behaviors. So we're going to talk about their senses, their feeding behaviors, thermoregulation, non-social behaviors, social behaviors sexual behaviors, and welfare of cats. Um, so when it comes to our cats and finances, we have to take into account a few factors. So one is breed. Obviously, if you get a purebred cat or a pedigreed cat, this is going to be much more expensive than to just go down to your shelter and adopt a regular old domestic short, medium, or long-haired cat. And purebred cats rarely come spayed or neutered, whereas you're more likely to have a cat be already spayed and neutered at the time of adoption when you adopt from a shelter or a rescue, uh, very similar to dogs in this aspect. We also need to make sure that we're financially prepared for their food. So the type and quality of the diet that you choose is the primary impact on cost on this. Again, much like with dogs. The higher quality of the diet, the greater the upfront cost, but long term, the cost is spread out more because of the nutritional density of the diet. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here later on. Uh, veterinary care is another big one. So, unfortunately, vet care doesn't come for free. Pet insurance is becoming more and more popular and more comprehensive these days, which is fantastic. But you still have to shell out some money for even just routine annual care which is really important for these guys as well as other animals in our care. And then maintenance. So purchasing litter on a regular basis to change litter boxes, toys, scratchers, and there's other costs as well for kitties. So we're going to go through what those look like so that if you don't have a cat and you're thinking about getting a cat, you're more financially prepared. Okay. So veterinary care is probably one of the biggest costs that any person with a pet is going to run into. And pet insurance is highly recommended because it is becoming more comprehensive these days and it is becoming much more worth the money in a lot of parts of the world. Not every country, but in a lot of parts of the world. So we need to make sure that we're understanding our core vaccinations for our kitty cats. So even if your cat is strictly indoor, they're at risk for some viral diseases that can be transported into the home via clothing or other animals that may live in the home. So feline respiratory viruses, rhinotracheitis and Khaleesi virus, can cause chronic respiratory disease in cats. And panleukopenia is a virus that attacks the gastrointestinal, nervous, and immune systems. Now many cats are vaccinated for these diseases in combination vaccine that's uh, abbreviated FVRCP, and that stands for feline viral rhinotracheitis, Khaleesi virus, and panleukopenia, and with boosters every one to three years after their kitten series. So they get a kitten series because mom's immunity is wearing off as their immune system is maturing. So the reason we do the boosters is to tide them over that low point in immunity to protect them. We also have to take into consider lifestyle dependent vaccinations. So indoor outdoor kitties are often recommended to be vaccinated for feline leukemia virus, abbreviated FELV. And this virus is one of the most common viral diseases in cats. It's transmitted by saliva and nasal secretions. It's often referred to as the nice cat disease because it can be transmitted through sharing bowls, rarely through litter boxes, but it can happen, bite wounds, and what's called allogrooming, so grooming each other for the purpose of bonding. And this virus suppresses the immune system of the cat, so making it makes them prone to other diseases and increases the difficulty and length of recovery if they do get sick. 
Now, despite this, many cats that are feline leukemia positive live long and fairly healthy lives. Their people usually take precautions. And testing for this disease is often done in kittens, but it should be done around 12 weeks of age when maternal antibodies have worn off to ensure it's as accurate as possible. So if you have a kitty that's feline leukemia positive, you can prevent other cats in the home from becoming feline leukemia positive by keeping them updated on this vaccine. And now indoor, outdoor, or outdoor cats are also at risk of what's called feline immunodeficiency virus, or FIV. And this also attacks the immune system, and it often results in these cats being much more susceptible to infections. So FIV is most commonly transmitted through bite wounds, and it's often referred to as the mean cat disease for this reason. Grooming, sharing bowls and litter boxes, and sexual contact are really not efficient ways to transmit the virus. So housemates that do not, do not fight are at a low risk of transmitting the disease if one is FIV positive. Most cats that are FIV positive are cats that have been previous indoor, outdoor, or outdoor intact males. Most common way for this disease to be transmitted is through males fighting for females. Now, here. I lost my place. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so there is a vaccine for FIV, but it's really not commonly used and it can result in false positives on FIV tests. So it's not typically administered. And cats cohabitating with FIV positive cats should be tested annually for FIV by their veterinarian. So now taking all of that into consideration, we also want to make sure that we're addressing monthly parasite prevention. So cats, just like dogs, are prone to heartworm disease. Now in cats, heartworm disease is not treatable. So if you live in an area where heartworm disease is an issue, you wanna make sure that your cat, even your indoor only cat, is on heartworm prevention. And the same with other parasites such as fleas and ticks. There's lots of different medications out there that are highly effective and very safe for kitties for heartworm and flea and tick prevention. It just depends on what your cat prefers. If they like treats, you may be able to give an oral for heartworm prevention. Most flea and tick preventions are topical on kitties because kitties are very sensitive to medications. And you can also do all in one. So there's uh, at least one product that does heartworm, some intestinal parasites, fleas and ticks for kitty cats. And heartworms are transmitted by mosquitoes so if, again, if heartworm is a disease that's present in your area, mosquitoes can get into your house and they can transmit them to your cat through biting them, just like with dogs. So we wanna make sure that we're understanding that as well. Routine lab work is also really important for kitty cats, just like the, it is for dogs. So typically on an annual basis, veterinarians are going to recommend doing a stool sample check because we can track in microscopic parasite eggs on our shoes and our pant legs or other animals that are in the house can bring them in from outside. Um, checking blood as well. Cats are very stoic. They don't tend to show us what is going on internally until they can't really help it. So we like to track trends over time with blood work. The other thing is that we don't always know when our kitties, especially our older kitties, are starting to develop some age-related changes such as renal disease or thyroid disease. And so tracking these trends over time helps us to start trying to get ahead of those things before we really see large changes occur. And then also checking urine. So one of the most common behavioral problems in cats is urinating outside the litter box. And the first rule that we need to abide by with this is making sure that we are ruling out urinary tract infections. And annual urinalysis is also great because then we can see preventatively, are we starting to see problems like crystals in the urine? Are we starting to see changes in the concentration that can mean there's issues with our kidneys, so on and so forth. Now, microchipping is a big one. Microchips are becoming a lot more common and some cities are requiring them now. And microchips are often recommended for cats regardless of their lifestyle. So they're small, about the size of a grain of rice, and they're implanted under the skin between the shoulder blades. 
when scanned, an ID number or alphanumeric code, depending on the chip, that's unique to that specific chip appears on the scanner. And this code is linked to the animal in which the chip is implanted in the microchip company's database in order to be able to alert the owner when the animal is found and scanned. This significantly increases the likelihood that a pet is going to be returned to their home in the event that they're lost or stolen. Because nobody's going to go digging out microchips. It's just way too difficult to do that. Now, due to the large size of the needle required for implantation of a microchip, it's usually recommended to implant it during spays and neuters or even dental cleanings to prevent any unnecessary discomfort. It's about a 12-gauge needle for those of you that know how large that is. Now, spaying and neutering is another important thing. So we want to make sure that we're making good decisions as far as their health. So sterilization of your cat can help to prevent unwanted sexually related behaviors as well as an increased likelihood of roaming in cat fights. Um, I'm sorry, such as an in increased likelihood of roaming in cat fights as well as aiding in population control. Males that are left intact and allowed to roam are at an increased risk for fight wounds due to the conflict with other tomcats over access to females in addition to other resources in their territory. So it's important to note that domestic cats are also known as what's called forced ovulators. So this means that a female cat is never really going to completely go out of heat until she's mated with a male cat. The mating process stimulates the female's ovaries to finally release the eggs for fertilization and implantation in the uterus. So, in short, if you have a female cat that's not spayed and you're going crazy because she's always in heat, you might consider spaying her if you're not planning to have kittens. So, the last thing about veterinary care that we want to address is illness and injury. So, obviously, we never want our pets to get injured or become ill, but these are big costs if they do happen sometimes. So again, looping back, highly, highly recommend pet insurance if you have it available in your area and it covers um, a good portion of things. Some pet insurances still are not really worth the investment, but if you live in an area where it is, I would strongly recommend doing so. Okay, any questions before I move on? Okay, I don't see anybody typing, so I'm going to go ahead and go. All right, so this is kind of our vaccine schedule. So for kitties at eight weeks of age, if not a little bit sooner, so six weeks is the earliest that you can really start vaccinating. Um, but eight weeks is when they would get their first FVRCP, so it's that feline distemper combination vaccine. And then at 12 weeks, we're looking at doing that with the first feline leukemia vaccine after they've been tested. And for the first year, most veterinarians are going to recommend having cats vaccinated for feline leukemia because sometimes their lifestyle status changes. Sometimes we get a cat that's like, no, you can't keep me indoors. I'm going to be outside no matter what you try to do to keep me in. And so we want to make sure that if that happens, we're keeping them protected. And then at 16 weeks, they get a booster of both of those vaccines plus their rabies, typically. So now that's dependent on local laws. I have a little key up at the top here. Some places require it as early as 12 weeks. And some places will allow up to 16 weeks. So whatever your local laws are, make sure that you're abiding by them. That's the most important thing. Now, at a year of age, typically rabies is boosted, again, typically, along with feline distemper vaccine and then feline leukemia if it's still necessary for that individual cat. And from there, as far as whether rabies is required to be boosted on an annual basis or not, again, is dependent on local laws. And then feline distemper vaccine is most typically readministered at about every three years after that because we have research that shows that the vaccine provides immunity for at least that long. So you may not have to get vaccines done every single year on your cat. Now, annual lab work for adult kitties, looking at um, heartworm testing, 
again, dependent on where you live in the in the world. Complete blood cell count, chemistry, uh, fecal, typically recommended every six months because especially if your cat's not on intestinal parasite prevention or heartworm prevention, which typically covers some intestinal parasites, they're at a higher risk of contracting intestinal parasites that we look for in those fecals. And then again, a urinalysis. Annual lab work for seniors is the same stuff plus a thyroid. Older cats are more prone to thyroid disease. Hyperthyroidism is what we most typically see in cats. So senior lab work typically includes a baseline thyroid screen for this reason. Okay. So this is our basic home setup. When it comes to, oh no. When it comes to our basic home setup, we need to make sure we're addressing our litter boxes, our food and water, our toys, vertical surfaces, and hiding spaces. So cats are solitary by nature, generally speaking. We need our feeding stations in a multi-cat household to be away from each other. And then your water sources also need to be away from food as well as elimination areas. The reason behind this is because when cats go out and they're hunting for mice or squirrels or birds or whatever, they're not going to be drinking from water sources near where they're catching prey because there's a risk of contamination of that water source. So they're going to look for water sources that are away from there. They're also going to be looking for running water, preferably. So if you have a cat that at home likes to tap the surface of their water with their paw, that's a normal behavior. They are disrupting the surface of the water to ensure that it's clean. If you have a cat that prefers to drink from a fountain, that's also very normal because running water is going to inherently be cleaner than standing water. Now our vertical surfaces really help cats to survey their surroundings and they provide scratching surfaces, they limit conflicts regarding space access because they have room to get up and away from each other and then our hiding spaces promote a feeling of safety. So we also need to make sure we have appropriate toys to facilitate safe play. So our primary concerns are we need to make sure that we have easy access to elimination areas, separate feeding stations, appropriate surfaces and hiding spaces, and appropriate toys. Okay, and then this is our, our litter box setup. The most common thing that I hear about litter boxes is, I don't want to see the litter boxes. That's kind of just too bad if you have a cat. You're not... You're not going to ever be able to go completely away from the litter box. And if you're toilet training your cat, that's completely inappropriate. That is not a normal behavior. And a lot of these cats have a lot of struggles surrounding appropriate elimination when they're toilet trained. So our general rule is at least one litter box per cat plus one more. Ideally, each litter box should have a low entry for ease of use, especially if you have small cats like a kitten or an older cat. Litter has got to be scooped daily. Must, must, must be scooped daily, guys. That's so important to make sure that they have a clean potty. We need to make sure that we're using soft, sandy substrate. So substrate would be your litter. That doesn't have fragrances. That's the most preferred with cats. Cats are very scent sensitive. So if you're using a heavily perfumed litter and your cat's not wanting to use a litter box, try an unscented litter. Okay? There's really no such thing as too much litter, okay? Some cats, they like to try to dig to China when they're trying to go potty, but there is such a thing as too little, okay? So uh, it just depends on the individual cat. Some really like to just dig really deeply or just have a large amount of litter to cover their waist. Your litter boxes need to be of adequate depth to accommodate this, but they should also be easy for the cat to get in and out of, okay? Most cats prefer an open or an uncovered litter box. The reason is because when they're going potty, they're vulnerable. If they're vulnerable it, and they can observe their surroundings, they're going to feel a lot better about where they're going potty. So if you have covered litter boxes and your cats are not using litter boxes appropriately, take the covers off. See if that helps. Okay. 
we need to make sure that the litter boxes are placed separate from each other and away from food and water sources. Okay, so pretty common saying, you don't shit where you eat. Don't make your cat do that. That's rude and it's not normal. They need to be placed in areas where the cat is not going to be startled by accident. So don't put litter boxes by the washer, the dryer, the furnace, the water heater, those sorts of places where they could be startled when they're trying to go potty because that will create a negative association with the litter box. But the litter boxes should also be in low traffic areas. So I know online we see these coffee table end table looking litter boxes that are meant to uh, be discreet you can use those if you want your cat will use them but please don't put them in your living room or somewhere that's high traffic and then if you have a multi-level home you need one box on every level of the home for ease of access especially in a multi-cat house because if you have cats that are in conflict a lot of times, cats will guard the litter boxes. And if you have litter boxes right next to each other, most cats perceive that as just one litter box. A lot of cats prefer to urinate in one box and defecate in another. So you can see how it's really important to have an appropriate litter box set up. What questions do you guys have about litter boxes? All right, none, we'll keep going. All right, so let's talk about indoor versus outdoor lifestyles. So this tends to be a pretty controversial subject, whether you allow your cat to be outside or whether they should be strictly indoor. Uh, in the UK, in the US, many other parts of the world, whoa, what is happening? Why? Why is it none of my slideshows can go smoothly? This is fantastic. <laughs> Sorry, guys. You get a sneak peek at the rest of the presentation, apparently. Uh, so, a lot of areas of the world allow cats to be outside. And this is more common in rural areas compared to urban or suburban areas. But in the U.S., less than half of cats in the US are considered outdoor kitties. So more than half are indoor. And it really shouldn't come as a surprise that we have all of these bullet points here. So an indoor cat's gonna have an increased average lifespan, but they're also going to have an increased need for active provision of enrichment and exercise. They also have an increased risk of becoming overweight and having weight-related diseases, and they may not have adequate cat spaces for their individual preferences. Now, an outdoor cat is not always a great idea either. We have an increased risk of exposure to toxins, predators, or other health risks. There's a lot of cats that get hit by car, cars, and it's just devastating for people. A lot of cats get lost, and people don't know what happened to them. Uh, they might get picked up by rescues. They might get picked up by neighbors and taken in. Their average lifespan is much lower. They also are a risk to natural wildlife because of hunting. There are places in the world that have completely banned cats because of the impact that cats have had on native species. But outdoor cats are often considered to be happier due to freedom to, quote unquote, be a cat. So it's not so much that it's an issue of right or wrong when it comes to the in indoor outdoor lifestyle debate. But for those who do want to give their cats outdoor access but worry about the risk, there's a lot of really great options. So most basically, you want to make sure that your cat's microchipped if you want them to be fully outdoors and not restrained by a catio or an outdoor play area. And that just helps to ensure that if your cat's picked up believed to be, or believed to be lost, they can be traced back to you. You have to keep your information up to date at all times with the microchip company. Okay? 
And keeping your cat on the side at night limits the risk of being hit by vehicles in the dark. And it's a much safer alternative to having GPS or other collars, which really are not without their own risk, even if they're breakaway collars. Sometimes they don't always break away. Now, the only way to really allow your cat to access the outdoors without any major risk to their life or welfare is to have a purpose-built enclosure in your garden or balcony that allows them to enjoy the outside freely while also remaining secure. So, a catio. You can also train your cat to walk on a harness if you'd like to let your cat have a more controlled exploration of a larger area. And if you're interested in enriching your cat's life inside, then next week we're going to talk about feline enrichment, so you should tune in for that. So, And that's where we're going to discuss some things about what to include in your home and your garden so that you can give your cat a more fulfilling life. Make sure that you're avoiding toxic plants and cleaning products in your home for kitty cat safety. Wires, cords, open windows, unstable heavy furniture, those are all hazards to the safety and well-being of any cat in your home, and really any animal. So we just really need to make sure we're giving them their own appropriate spaces and appropriate items as well. All right. Here's the big question. Do cats need grooming? I know we talk a lot about grooming with dogs. We don't talk about it a lot with cats. But good news, everyone. Cats are mostly considered self-cleaning. So your average indoor kitty needs their nails trimmed about once a month or so, even if this is just taking the tips off of them. And older and obese cats, hmm, I spelled obese wrong, may not bathe as often or as thoroughly, and they might need more frequent brushing, especially cats with long coats. They should be brushed daily to prevent matting in hard-to-reach areas. So we're talking like... Their underarms, talking about like their pants, so that all that long fluffy hair on the back of their legs. And especially if your cat is older or obese, make sure that you're helping them out by brushing them. Now, long haired cats that have chronic hairball or chronic matting problems might actually benefit from professional grooming, including haircuts. Uh, mo- the most common haircut for cats is a lion cut, where their legs or at least uh, the lower half of their legs are not shaved, and they're left with a tuft on their tail and a mane around their head. Um, And what this does is it basically just takes the vast majority of the hair off of their body to make it easier for them to groom themselves. I see a question about to pop up. Okay, we are about to move into the behavior portion of this presentation. What questions do you guys have before we move into that segment? Okay, I don't see any coming up. So we're going to talk about the senses that cats have. So cats see the world much differently than us. They are more crepuscular in nature, so this means that they're more active around dusk and dawn. They're not truly nocturnal. So there's a strong belief among people that cats can see in the dark. And while there, that isn't inherently the case, cats can see far better in dimmed light than we can. So they're pupils will dilate in low light situations and they have a reflective membrane in the back of their eye called the tapetum lucidum. So this is a very special reflective layer of tissue that lays underneath the retina. So what happens is the light comes into the eye through the pupil. It hits the retina where the light detecting cells live. And that's all that we have in humans. And the brain interprets it from there. In cats, the light will then hit the tapetum lucidum and go back through the retina before the brain interprets it. So they can see a lot better in the dark because they're basically getting a double whammy through that retina of the light. And you can see this in dogs as well. 
Uh, it's also believed at this time that cats don't really see the color red like we do, kind of like dogs, but rather see in a variety of blues, greens, and various combinations. It's a bit more difficult to tell in cats because they tend to be a little less compliant when doing the exercises that they performed with dogs as to color discrimination. So they also have fairly exceptional hearing. They have an extra fold in their ears, which allow them to hear s sounds better at night. And, at, and sounds at a much higher frequency than us. So because of this, many cats find some noises more aversive than what we would perceive or even just like the quiet buzz of electronics and monitors and those sorts of things because their hearing is quite a bit more exceptional. So cats also have these have whiskers. We're all very familiar with cat whiskers. These are actually tactile hairs at the end of nerve endings. So these are really sensitive. Cats use their whiskers to make sure that they can fit through spaces. So the length of cat's whiskers is correlated to the width of their body. If they can fit their whiskers through an opening, they can fit the rest of themselves through an opening, which is why we never want to cut the whiskers on cats. Never, 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 never. Their nose has about 45 to 80 million scent receptors, which makes their sense of smell about 14 times as strong as humans, which is why cats are so scent sensitive. Um, they also have their tail, which not every cat has a tail, but ca those cats that do have a tail, it's used for balance and it's also used for communication. And then their paws are very sensitive. They're similar to dogs and similar to um, hands and people with their sensitivity for uh, tactile purposes. So cats are just kind of really cool little creatures. Now their senses really play into a lot that we need to go over as far as their behavior. So now all feeding by predators and herbivores involves a complex series of decisions and involves a particular hunger system that is comprised of three main parts. So you have per perceptual mechanisms for recognizing food. So this goes back to our sense of scent and scent of, sense of taste. A central hunger mechanism for eating and coordinating movement and then motor mechanisms for locating and ingesting food. So those are our three components there. And cats are almost entirely carnivorous. They are obligate carnivores. And what this means is that they require animal components in their diet to meet nu their nutritional needs. Okay, so this is meat, blood, etc. Because of this, cats are unable to sustain their metabolic functions on vegetarian diets. Cats that are fed vegetarian and vegan diets begin to suffer very quickly and they experience very severe health issues, including blindness and dilated cardiomyopathy from a lack of taurine and arginine. These taurine and arginine are essential amino acids, meaning they have to be provided in the diet for cats that are found in animal tissues. So it also exacerbates pre-existing urinary issues and severe impact of organ development in kittens when they're on a vegetarian or vegan diet. So cats will, will hunt for active prey by moving through their environment and chasing what prey animals they encounter or by lying in wait in an appropriate place and pouncing on the prey that drives. I'm sorry, that arrives. When prey is digested, bones... And indigestible fiber, such as hair, are either processed in the digestive system and excreted in waste, or they're vomited up. So, we have to bear in mind 
all of these things when we're feeding our cat. So when we're choosing a diet for our cat, we want to make sure that one, of course, it's not vegetarian or vegan. We don't want it to be high in raw plant matter. And what that means is we don't want to be offering our cats like, hey, here, have this fresh stock of broccoli. They're not going to be able to, to digest it. They don't have the correct digestive enzymes to process raw plant matter. Now, plant matter in the prey GI tracts is pre-digested for them. So that they can process for the most part. But they can't do it by themselves. We also have to bear in mind that cats evolved in desert-like conditions, so they require a high moisture content in their diet because they also have a low thirst drive. So dry food, while it's good for their teeth, is not considered an ideal diet for the cat, not by itself. Now, you may have some cats like my cat who she loves her kibble and she gets upset if she's not offered kibble at least once a day. But I also provide her with canned food. And she has running water in her fountain to encourage her to try to drink. And cats are very picky eaters, so sometimes you do run into this. But ideally, they should be fed a high moisture content diet. So there's a big debate between canned versus raw versus kibble. And really, the most important thing is that their diet is complete and balanced appropriately for cats, that we're providing the appropriate moisture content for them as much as we reasonably can. And we want to make sure that we're also aware of public health risks when it comes to raw fed animals if you choose to raw feed. So that means you need to make sure that you're very sanitary with your food preparation, that you're letting people know that your cat is raw fed so that if they have immunocompromised or what have you, you know, they can be aware of that and make the choice as to whether or not they want to interact. So in the end, what you choose for your cat just needs to be complete and balanced for the species it's intended for and contain animal components to meet their nutritional needs. Okay, uh, nutrition is a big hot button topic, so I just want to ask if anybody has any questions before we move on. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on here. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the macronutrient recommendations for cats. So our macronutrients are our primary nutritional groups. So that's protein, carbohydrates, and fat. So a cat's diet, about 50% of the daily calories should come from protein. This doesn't mean that the food itself needs to be 50% protein. It means the calories, 50% of daily calories should come from protein, okay? Protein-heavy diets are calorie-heavy diets. Carbohydrates should make up 10% or fewer daily calories, and fat should mean approximately, meet approximately 30% of daily calorie needs. What's really cool is that if we look here at the nutritional content of mice, mice fit a good portion of a cat's needs, which is why it's a very common source of prey for them. So about 5% of the mouse is carbohydrate content, 48% of it is moisture, and then 47% is basically the rest of the mouse. So this is a high moisture food item that's low in carbohydrate for kitties. And that rest of the 47% is going to be your fat and your protein and, and all of those types of nutritional content. So I thought this was just really interesting and I wanted to include it because um, it kind of gives some good insight as to why mice are a popular prey item for cats. Okay, so we're going to talk about their thermoregulatory behaviors. So cats are very different from dogs. They, their differences aren't just in diet and behavior and appearance. They also go into thermoregulation. So cats are basically solar-powered batteries that are really cute and fluffy. It's more common than not to find a cat basking or napping in a sunbeam over a heating vent 
or really in any other place that's warm. And they do this to conserve energy by allowing passive heat from whatever it is that they're absorbing warmth from to help them maintain their body temperature. And some cats might even exhibit burrowing behaviors to accomplish this passive heat gathering to conserve energy. But if cats spend all this time keeping warm, then how do they keep cool in the event that they do get too hot? So while cats don't sweat like people do in order to keep cool, they do have some other mechanisms to regulate their body temperature. They can sweat through their paws. It's not adequate thermoregulation in and of itself. So cats will also groom themselves to keep from overheating. So they'll apply saliva to their hair coat. And as that saliva evaporates, it creates a cooling effect. Now, in extreme heat, cats will pant, but this is considered an abnormal respiratory rate and effort in cats. So it indicates that they need to be moved to a cooler area. And cats will also pant in times of extreme stress. So it's important to note that cats never pant in the same way that dogs pant, except in those two examples. These videos that we see of cats in cars and out in public that circulate with the idea that the cat is weird or dog-like or other labels are completely inappropriate. The panting cat is extremely stressed or overheated. There are no exceptions to this. Absolutely none. Okay. Let's see. So let's talk about some other non-social behaviors. As far as their non-social behaviors go, we're pretty familiar with their weirdness that makes cats so endearing. But why do they perform these behaviors? So we're going to start with the, one of the most odd behaviors that we see with cats, and that's chattering. So the exact reason that cats chatter is unknown, but it's most likely from overstimulation or frustration. Okay? And that's the current thought among behaviorists because it's typically exhibit, exhibited by cats that have prey in their sights, but they can't access it. So this is commonly seen in cats that are watching the world through a window or a glass door, and birds or small animals that would normally be prey catch their attention. And then we also have feline nocturnal vocalization. This can be as simple as an attention-seeking behavior or it could be medical in nature. So if your cat is, seems to be vocalizing excessively at night, we need to take those things into account, especially in older cats where it might be related to discomfort from arthritis or related to feline hyperthyroidism. So if you've noticed these changes in your cat, contact your vet, okay? Now let's talk about boxes. What is the deal with cats in boxes? We've all seen it, or even have, the cat that decides, if I fits, I sits. So then the question is, why are cats, even big cats, so attracted to boxes? Well, it might not surprise you to find out that the great outdoors and even many of our homes don't offer small enclosed spaces that can provide a feeling of safety and comfort for our adorable little predator companions, but boxes do. So many cats enjoy playing, napping, playing, napping, and even just kind of hanging out in boxes simply because the enclosed space is comfortable for them, while others find them to be prime spots to ambush unsuspecting ankles from. So now this is one of our favorite classic cat behaviors, and that's knocking surfaces knocking items off of surfaces for no reason. And the current thought on this is it's most likely curiosity and self-entertainment. All right. So let's talk about our resting behaviors in cats. So cats spend about 40 to 65% of their 24-hour cycle asleep and for more than 20 percent of that time the sleep is in REM cycle so that's rapid eye movement okay and they might sleep on their sternum with their legs partly folded or 
laterally with their legs stretched out or curled up. It just depends on the cat. It doesn't really mean anything as far as the position that they're sleeping in. Um, so, the cool thing is that studies have shown that in cats younger than 17 days, there's a higher proportion of REM sleep than in older animals. And this is a big part of where brain development is taking place. And now when they're not sleeping, they're most often awake at night for hunting purposes. So this is your cat's circadian rhythm. It's typically they wake up, they hunt, they eat, groom themselves, sleep, lather, rinse, repeat. Okay. So we want to make sure that we're trying to cater to this as much as possible. And we're going to go more in depth with this in next week's lecture about feline enrichment. But for our indoor kitties, play serves as a substitute for hunting and exercise. So if you've ever noticed that when you play with your cat, they then groom themselves and take a nap. But that's very, very normal. Other ways that we can emulate this normal circadian rhythm for cats is to use prey model feeders. So this simulates much of the hunting sequence for our indoor kitties to foster that natural behavior in an appropriate outlet to work with their normal daily rhythm. And what a prey model feeder is, is basically a food dispensing toy. So you can put food in the toy and then you hide it and then the cat comes across it and they start figuring out to go hunting for these things when they're hungry, which is really cool. And definitely something that's important for the welfare of our kitty cats. Okay, before we get into social behaviors, does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. So, social behaviors. Bunting, so this is uh, the gentle headbutting that we often see. Making biscuits, bonding behaviors, giving gifts, body language. We're going to cover all of that. So feline social behaviors as a whole are rather primitive and they're limited compared to dogs, but they come with their own complexities. Bonding behaviors are actually quite common in cats and are big displays of affection. Even subtle body language cues can actually be considered rather overt in regards to how cats communicate with one another. So if you've ever wondered why cats like to rub their faces on people and objects, it's a common display of affection. So bunting is when a cat gives a gentle headbutt or rubs their face on another individual or surface. And this action is often done in a manner that brings the pheromone glands in their face into contact with the individual or the surface. And this releases specialized chemical that signals safety and comfort to the cat. So the glands on the side of the face, between the eyes, and the sides of the mouth, these can be evident as darker regions on tabby cats. There's a glandular area at the base of the tail that may also be darker in tabbies and some other breeds. And essentially, the mark that's deposited indicates to a particular indicates that a particular cat was present and in control of an interaction at that point. So as well as it being a sign of affection when a cat rubs up against you, this can also be interpreted as the cat communicating its presence or even ownership to other cats. And making biscuits, kneading, paw massage, whatever you want to call it, a large number of cats will display this behavior. It's most likely left over from kittenhood as a remnant of nursing behaviors. When nursing, kittens will massage the mammary glands of the queen, the mother cat, to aid in the release of milk and bonding pheromones. So there's actually pheromone glands along the teats of the mother cat that will produce these chemicals. Weaned kittens and adult cats, however, will often display this as a sign of content or even to self-soothe if feeling mildly distressed. Now, bonding between cats is a really endearing sight, but how do cats bond other than kneading and bunting. 
So cats that enjoy each other's company will often play. They'll sleep touching each other and groom each other, which is known as allo grooming. It, so it's social grooming of individuals of the same species. That's the definition of allo grooming. And while cats are not generally accepting of other cats as adults, some can learn together and become what's called preferred associates or good company for each other. Cats that sleep not cuddled up or don't groom each other do not find each other to be great company, even if they do play together occasionally. Cats that sleep near each other are trusting of the presence of the other cat, but they don't enjoy their company enough to bond with them by sleeping together. Now, good playmates will take turns being the aggressor, but if one cat is consistently the aggressor, then the play is no longer mutual and it's become bullying. So, let's talk about giving gifts, because I think this is probably everybody's favorite thing that their cats do where they bring a mouse or a bug or some other critter that may or may not be alive and may or may not be missing body parts? The answer is that cats don't know that we don't want it. But what they're doing is their, it's their way of trying to teach you to be a master predator, basically. This is the current hypothesis. Mother cats will teach their young to hunt by bringing dead or nearly dead prey to the kittens. Because of this, female cats tend to be more prone to this particular behavior. So if you'd like to laugh about it, you're welcome to feel free to think of it as their way of saying, like, I don't completely dislike you, but you're a terrible predator and I don't want you to die. So let's talk about our body language in our cats. So we have... Again, their social behaviors are limited, but what social behaviors they have are strong behaviors. So facial expressions are really important with cats, just like with dogs, but their expressions are somewhat different. Slow blinks with soft eyes are known as cat kisses, and they're given when a cat feels comfortable enough to relax around the person they slow blink at. At the same time, a hard stare is considered overtly aggressive between cats and so along with other behaviors such as blocking doorways and access to resources a lot of what we see as aggression between cats is just hard stares you'll often see that cats that are doing hard giving hard stares will have their ears completely upright and facing forward or even pinned back versus upright and relaxed in conjunction with slow blinks. Then we also have our tail movements. So a slowly waving tail that's held high is an indicator of a content or happy cat that's willing to interact. A bottle brush tail, so it's completely puffed out, indicates a terrified cat regardless of the position that it's held in. And a quickly wagging tail tells us that the cat is irritated and quickly losing their patience with whatever is going on. Often, we'll see cats with their tails held downward, but with an arch at the base during play or when faced with an object or individual that is startling to them. This position indicates they are in defense mode, but it doesn't always indicate they feel threatened since it's seen in normal play at times. Other tail positions include upright with a hook at the end, which means the cat's interested but not really sure about interacting, and held gently to one side which indicate when they're still, which indicates they're relaxed, and the tail held tightly against themselves indicates stress or fear. So just like with other animals, we have to interpret these cues in groups. A cat laying down with Upright ears and tail held softly at their side is clearly a relaxed cat, but compared to a cat that's laying down with its tail tight against them, ears back, and staring eyes, that cat's really stressed. So we want to make sure we're understanding our cat's mood because it's important in our ability to advocate for them and interact appropriately with them. Okay, so we're also going to be talking about spacing or territorial behaviors. So cats will mark certain individuals and objects by means of their facial paw and tail base glands as well as by 
urine spraying. Both males and females will spray. But males tend to be the culprits more often than females in this. And we've already discussed facial and tail glands, but we haven't covered the paw glands. One of the primary ways that cats mark their territory is by scratching objects within their territory. And this accomplishes three things. It's visually marking the area. It distributes pheromones from their paws onto the object. And then it's exercising their forelimb and chest muscle groups as well. Now, urine spraying is often on vertical surfaces, and it's typically in response to perceived invasion of the cat's established territory. Spraying like this is a very overt olfactory signal to other cats of the presence of the cat that's sprayed in an attempt to ward off these other cats from infringing upon that space. It's also a visual marker, depending on the color of the surface. Primarily, it's a scent marker. An active, noisy, and aggressive nocturnal defensive territory by cats is really considered to be more of a feature of human urban environments. The resolution of disputes can lead to injuries and may result in some individual cats showing great reluctance to venture outside the home as well. To have, for example, six cats within 20 adjacent small human houses can cause some violation of feline territory. And while much territorial behavior is often not observed, the consequence of such attacks may result in scratches or puncture to the face area. So this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with our risks of outdoor lifestyle. So let's talk about our normal structure, normal social structure of cats. So our normal social structure of cats is pretty fluid. Typically, cats will gather in colonies outside of areas where resources are plentiful, but all of these cats are interrelated females, okay? These are not, there are no males that are sexually mature within these colonies, okay? So, and by interrelated, we mean mothers, daughters, aunts, nieces, grandmothers, so on and so forth. Now, all of the females in the colony are equal socially okay and they will actually aid each other in rearing kittens by nursing litters that are not their own so this is known as allo nursing or nursing the young of others of the same species and females will actually go into season and mate without synchrony or restriction related to social structure so what this means is that you can have you know a few females that go into season in april and then in you know, May 1 or 2, and then in August, 10 of them go, and, you know, it's not synchronized as it is in other species, which is not to say that all species have synchronized mating, but several species do. <clears throat> so our males are solitary. They leave the colony when they reach sexual maturity, but they will return to colonies to seek females in heat, okay? So, because of this structure, cats are often stressed when a new cat comes in, so they have a lot of stranger danger. Outsiders are not welcome outside of mating times. And it makes it difficult when they are living with humans, because humans will tend to get multiple cats over time. So they might get a kitten, and then a couple years later get another kitten, and then a couple years later, a young adult cat. And that's really stressful to these guys. It's really best to adopt multiple cats together at a young age if you're going to have multiple cats. It increases the likelihood that they're going to bond well and learn how to cohabitate peacefully. There's going to be a lot less stress overall in integrating them together because they haven't reached that maturity level where they have gotten to the stranger danger we don't want outsiders point in their life they're still socially more receptive okay what questions do we have about social behaviors and social structure of cats
None? All right, we'll go ahead and move on. So we're going to talk about sexual behaviors of cats. So their first heat is usually around six months of age. It can be as early as four months of age, but that's not very common. And during this time, cats will have a, our female cats, obviously, our male cats don't go into heat. It's just the females. A female cat's going to have a surge of hormones, such as estrogen, that initiates the estrus cycle. And estrus is a term that applies principally to behavior, but can also be used to describe some internal physiological processes. It's the state in which the female seeks and accepts the male. The behavioral features are synchronized with various physiological changes of the estrus genital system essential for mating. So it should be noted that the internal and behavioral features of estrus normally occur simultaneously, but there have been cases where they've occurred separately, although that's very rare. So as we talked about earlier, cats are forced ovulators. It requires mating to stimulate the release of eggs. And in order to solicit mating, they will exhibit a number of behavioral changes, such as being more restless, reduced appetite, increased in locomotor investigative and vocal behaviors. Females far more tolerant of the male cat and will uh, show what's called lordosis, which is where she'll keep most of her body to the, like, the surface of the, or the floor and then raise her hindquarters. Uh, it's basically presenting her rear to the male. And our males are generally sexually mature around six months of age. So, like some females, this can be earlier or later, depending on the breed, season, geographic location in some cases. Our intact males who are indoor-outdoor cats are at a much higher risk of injury due to their roaming habits and increased likelihood of encountering other males. And cats are also one of the few species that engage in repeated mating behaviors. So, the male will mate again about 5 to 15 minutes after the initial encounter. So this helps to ensure the passage, passing on of genetic material to the next, to create the next generation. All right. So this is our last bit. We're going to talk about the welfare of cats. This is a huge, huge, huge thing across the globe. Many governments have passed legislation specific to the welfare and needs of domestic and farm animals. Uh, specifically in the UK, there was the Animal Wel Welfare Act in 2006 that outlines the provisions owners and keepers should make to ensure the animal has its needs met. So this is something that I would argue should apply everywhere. So while there's no one way to care for your cat, what works for some may not work for others. Every cat and every animal has some basic needs. So this, these are all specifically referring to the Animal Welfare Act of 2006 under Section 9 in the UK. It says you, the owner, must take steps that are, as are reasonable in all circumstances to meet the needs of your pet. The five basic needs outlined in this act are as follows. Need for a suitable environment. While this has already been discussed at length already, we just need to emphasize that you have to ensure that your cat is safe from hazards, has ample space if they're kept solely or even partially indoors, and common sense cat proofing, such as removing toxic plants, access to live cables or balconies and windows needs to be practiced. And for outdoor kitties or any cat that spends some time outside, they should also be protected from hazards as best as possible. Need for a suitable diet. As we talked about, cats cannot thrive on vegetarian or vegan diets. Their bodies are built to be carnivores, and they should be fed as such. Further to diet, your cat should be kept in good condition, so they should not be over or underweight. They need to be housed with or without other animals, as is species appropriate. So cats, unlike other species, don't necessarily need to be housed with or without other animals. Having said that, this part of the act does not specifically refer to animals as in pets, but also humans. In this case, your cat should not be left alone 
for such an amount of time that will negatively affect them. And while cats can generally be fine on their own while you work, it's absolutely unfair to leave them for a weekend with just food, water, and no social element. So you need to provide appropriate pet care if you're not going to be with them. They need to be able to exhibit normal behavior patterns. So cat behavior is very much dependent on age, breed, and health. But in either case, you should ensure that your cat is provided with sufficient mental and physical enrichment, which we'll talk about next week, that's appropriate to them. As a general rule, all cats need to be able to scratch, sleep, and play to be mentally and physically happy and enriched. And additionally, any changes in behavior patterns should be caused for a veterinary or behavioral evaluation. They also need to be protected from pain, injury, suffering, and disease. So we talked about it earlier, so it should come as no surprise. Cats are sentient beings that feel pain, and even if they don't always show it, providing your cat with regular health care and spaying or neutering can also have a number of health benefits, such as cancer prevention. So we want to make sure we're doing our best to take appropriate care of our cats. Uh, and then it also continues to make clear that you're responsible for all of your pet's needs and the needs of any animal whose care is under the charge of any children in your home under age 16, which I think is completely fair and, again, should be applied across the board. I would argue that most kids under the age of 16 should not be given the sole responsibility of a pet, and even if they are above the age of 16, if they're in a family home, it should be everyone's responsibility. All right, so let's talk about declawing. It might not surprise you that we are generally averse to being scratched by the claws of our feline companions, nocturnal vocalizations of cats, and even the rivalries that may form among cats that can lead to excessive noise and or injuries to our cats. There are generally two consequences to these issues. In the, first of the, in the case of the first point, it's certainly more advisable to train your cats to not use their claws in their interactions with us or on their furniture while offering appropriate alternative solutions. So we talked about scratchers, vertical surfaces. Those are really important. The alternative, which is the removal of claws, is not advised and has many negative side effects. One, the ability for the cat to defend itself is completely stripped away, and this affects the way in which the cat walks and has other normal functions. And this is because declawing is the amputation of the last bone of each digit in the paw to fully excise the nail. It is rarely medically necessary. And it is illegal in multiple countries. The long and the short of it is that declawing is mutilation for the convenience of humans. That is the be all end all of it. Now, the last point that we're going to make is that some training professionals and vets may also advise spaying and neutering your cat to stop behaviors such as urine, spraying, prowling for mates, and unsociable cat calls. And while there are many good and responsible reasons for spaying and neutering, if your main goal is to stop undesired behavior, then such a procedure is not going to be the complete answer. It will inhibit them if reproductive drive is the root cause for that individual case, but if not, spaying and neutering is not going to be the solution. So as always, we want to make sure that when we're addressing behavioral concerns, we're doing so in a comprehensive manner that addresses the root cause of the behavior, if we can ferret that out. And we want to make sure that every cat is our friend, because cats are wonderful. Okay, here are our resources for our presentation. That's all that I have for you guys as far as feline behavior and basic needs go. What questions, comments, concerns do you guys have? Nothing? Everything was perfectly answered? All right. Well, thank you guys for listening in. Really appreciate it as always. 
Uh, I didn't have an assistant for this one, but certainly since we're going to be posting these on the Creature Teacher YouTube channel, if you have not already, please like it, subscribe it, and feel free to share it. Uh, we are always, always, always happy to have more people join the server. Always, always, always happy to educate as much as we possibly can. Again, next week we're going to be talking about feline enrichment. And... Uh, if you guys have any further questions about anything we covered today, please just let me know.